banter, yeah. Light banter. Recording is on. Wow, that's loud. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that's a little annoying, but just to let everybody know, we're recording now. We are here with Mycroft founder, Joshua Montgomery. He's going to do his little light banter for a few minutes. And then we'll, while we wait for a few more people to join. And then we're going to hear about um, voice technology and why Mycroft is important. We do have a chat. If um, anybody wants to dump a few questions um, for Joshua to answer. So, hello, Joshua. Hello. So, a priest, an imam, and a rabbit walk into a bar, and the rabbit says, I'm pretty sure I'm a typo. <laughs> <laughs> Another one would be uh, two horses are standing in a field, and one horse looks at the other horse and says, I'm so hungry, I can eat a horse. And the other horse says, Is on. He's a dad. At least, at least I amused myself. So um, anyway. I was, gonna, I was gonna say now that you're a father, you have nothing but dad jokes. Yeah, there you go. Um, so it's a beautiful, oh. it's a beautiful uh Friday. And it looks like we've had a bunch of folks join us. Um here Mark says he missed the end of your last joke, your favorite joke. Moo. Moo. <laughs> uh it's a beautiful Friday. It is Friday. Thank goodness. It's that time of week. Um, at least I think it's Friday. It is Friday. We had a great meeting with uh, most of the Mycroft team that ended earlier this week. Yeah, that actually was really good, getting everybody together in the same room and uh, spending some time doing some higher level architecture stuff on the, on the software side and then uh, spending some time uh, working through the manufacturing on the manufacturing side. So all that was positive. So, um, so Chris, uh, it looks like we've got quite a few people here. Uh, did you want to get started? Please do. And can you remind me what the topic is for today? <laughs> the topic for today is generally whatever you feel um, you want to discuss, but I thought that a really great topic to cover today would be voice and why Mycroft is important. We've been hearing a lot recently about privacy issues and um, how Mycroft can help solve some of these problems that people are having with their devices spying on them. Okay, well, I think we should start with the renaming of the company. We're renaming the company effective tomorrow. Uh, we're going to call it Meta Meta, which is more meta than the other meta. Uh, it's self-referential, so that makes it fun and funny. Uh, I'm very thankful not to have a brand that's as damaged as the brand that Meta is trying to replace. I can't remember the name of the other company kind of slips the tongue now that they've replaced it with the, with the corporate name Meta. It just, it slips the mind, all of the behaviors and the other stuff that that company was involved in. Uh, so anyway, uh, you know, as you know, Facebook and other companies start building, you know, the metaverse, right. Uh, and they start building these online experiences that are truly immersive. Um, you know, one of the things that they're going to be doing is learning a whole lot about uh, the people who are using it. Uh, you know, it, it, it didn't make a lot of sense at the time for Amazon to launch Prime Video uh, because really they weren't in that in that business uh, the day that they launched it. Uh, and, you know, I, I kind of scratched my head as to like why they would get into into the production of uh, movies and TVs and was, was chatting with a friend and, you know, we came to the conclusion that, you know, you can learn so much about people from their preferences in movies and entertainment uh, that, you know, it looked to us like the, the launch of Amazon Prime was a, a mechanism for our friends at Amazon to learn more about their customers. And so, you know, launching all these these video services, uh, launching the metaverse yesterday, you know, it, in every case, it seems to me to be a, a ploy or a tool um, to allow these companies to access uh, more information about about folks and sell their attention. Um, and then, of course, sell them products and services, uh, either from the company directly, like our, our friends at Apple or, um, you know, from third parties like the, the folks at Amazon. So so anyway, so as the the integration between the real world and the virtual world 
uh, continues to, as things continue to get closer and closer and more and more meshed together, um, you know, it becomes increasingly important for there to be options for all these various services that do provide privacy um, and allow people to pay for what they get and not be forced them to pay in a currency that they, they wouldn't normally pay with, you know, the, uh, for me, at least that means, you know, when I, when I pay for a video service, I, I just want to pay for the videos. I don't want to watch a 30 second ad every, every five or 10 minutes. Um, you know, for me, that means on the, the voice side of things, you know, paying for a voice assistant that represents me as the, uh, as the person using it and not the company that's shipping it. So that's what we've built at Mycroft. And, uh, and that's what we're, we're aiming to ship in a significant way uh, later on in, in uh, 2022. Um, so, you know, the, the next question is, is kind of what is the future of that product that we're shipping? And, and we've been having some pretty deep conversations. And actually this week we, we had several uh, really good uh conversations about the upcoming roadmap and and you know for us it, it looks like it's a path towards uh, you know a, a software focused company that does very very little in hardware um, it looks like it's a path towards uh, you know integrating into other folks' devices as opposed to shipping devices ourselves um, and then it looks like it's a path towards you know empowering individuals and companies to deploy voice uh, without being beholden to you know our servers and infrastructure being able to, to put it entirely on the premises. Uh, and so, you know, that's very much where we're headed. Um, I think there are there's some noise from some of the other providers in that that direction. I saw that uh, there's an integration going on uh, with Walt Disney that includes uh, a bunch of tech from Amazon, um, you know, but, you know, one of the things that, that we're really uh, privileged to have as a company and it is a reputation for being private and, and I think that the, the competitors that we compete against really are going to have challenges about at telling a privacy story. Um, you know, even if you rebrand it meta, uh, Facebook is going to have a lot of trouble convincing people that they're going to respect their privacy. Uh, and the same for a lot of the other Silicon Valley companies. And, you know, voice assistant tech is looking like it's going to be integrated everywhere. Right in in home offices, uh, in kitchens, in garages, certainly, but also in corporate offices, in retail environments, in automotive, in uh, leisure and travel. You know, we recently did a project with NASA uh, working on, in the aerospace sector, and, and in all of these cases, you know, companies and individuals are looking for uh, the ability to build a voice assistant that solves a problem for them, uh, that solves it in many cases in a way that keeps their their individual or corporate information private. And, you know, they're looking to expand, you know, the coverage of the voice technology onto manufacturing floors, onto uh, cruise ships and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, the next question is, is what does that mean for us as a company? And, and I think that it means that we have a, a very clear path towards success. You know, the, the, We've been working for a number of years on the core technology. We, we were doing voice assistants before Amazon and Google made them cool. Uh, you know, we we shipped the Mark One a couple of years ago. Uh, we're in the process of getting the Mark Two out the door. Um, you know, uh, supply chain supply chain willing, and you know, have had a lot of information or, or a lot of uh, inquiries from you know all kinds of of you know big manufacturers and uh, manufacturing consortiums and government agencies and, you know, schools and, and others. So uh, it looks like it, the, the market is really, is really ours to address. And, you know, and, and it looks like the, the, uh, you know, the, the team is on the right track towards, towards getting us there. Uh, our plans for next year are to start shipping uh, 5,000 units a month when, the manufacturing lines uh, starts and then start shipping significantly more after that as we work towards uh, building a software solution uh, and seek partners that are interested in integrating Mycroft in their own uh, smart speakers and their own automobiles and, and uh, aircraft and cruise ships and hotels and, and other places. So, uh, so yeah, that's kind of where the future lies for us. And in terms of the experience, um, you know, the, the, that J that kind of, uh, 
artificial or janky back and forth experience that, that we have with smart speakers today, where you say the wake word, wait for a response, give it a single query, it may or may not understand the context, uh, you know, you have to go back and ask the same question over again. Uh, that is clearly evolving towards a much more natural conversation, both uh, within our stack as well as the stacks of our competitors. Uh, you know, five or 10 years from now, I think that conversations with mm -hmm. voice assistants are going to be much, much more natural than they are today. And 20 to 25 years from now, I think it's going to be very difficult for people interacting with voice assistants mm -hmm. across their domain of expertise. So, you know, talking about things like music and pop culture and, you know, anything on Wikipedia. Uh, I think that folks will be able to have conversations with their voice assistants that, that seem natural enough that, that folks are going to have trouble determining whether or not it's a, it's a voice assistant in some cases. Uh, and that, you know, future experience opens a lot of doors uh, for these technologies to be deployed everywhere, really. Um, and, you know, for us, it's, it's really important that there be an option for, for companies and individuals and, you know, communities that, that might not speak a major language as their primary language, uh, for those communities to have access to voice technology that speaks their language, protects their information, provides them with privacy. And so, you know, that's what we're building here at Microft. So anyway, uh, that's a, a nice little uh, primer on, you know, where we're going. I, I'd love to talk to the community a little more and kind of answer some questions and address any uh, concerns that folks have. Um, I know that we do a lot of broadcast uh, in our messaging. So we're on email and chat and, uh, you know, we do email uh, or we do uh, uh, blasts through the press. Um, you know, I've been on a lot of podcasts lately, but haven't had a lot of back and forth with the broader community. So um, so, yeah, I'd love to open the floor to questions. And I don't know if Chris is going to moderate or how I believe you can just unmute and ask a question. It's up to you if you would like. Um, Roger Austin just asked, will Mycroft be used for commerce? Will it accept payments? And does Mycroft have a payments partner? So that might be um, something that he's specifically interested in. But um, you have had some thoughts about payments in the past. Did you want to share those really quick? Yeah. So um, the, the skills framework that we've built really is designed to allow uh, both individuals and companies to deploy things easily um, and to deploy uh, new capabilities easily. And, and one of the obvious capabilities for the, for the smart speaker stack, especially given how much uh, marketing uh, Amazon's put into it with Alexa is, is buying things, right? Whether it's goods or services or whatnot. Um, we do accept payments today, uh, at least for using the back end of of the Mycroft stack. Uh, and we, we use a, I think an off the shelf payment partner for that. Uh, but, you know, as we move forward, I think that there are going to be a lot of additional opportunities for commerce within, within the voice assistant space. You know, um, I think one of the, the cool things about the concept of user agency, which is something that we really strongly endorse, uh, is the concept that the voice assistant that you talk to when you work with, with Mycroft is, uh, represents you as the customer and not us as a company, right? And so, you know, if we build a, a commerce um, a commerce skill that allows you to, you know, add things to a shopping list and then deploy those shopping lists to vendors to have, have things delivered, uh, you know, at the, at the end of that experience, our goal would be to have, you know, that shopping list be parsed out to various different companies based on your best interest. Uh, and have those products show up to you at the the lowest cost um, and the highest speed possible, um, not, you know, dividing that shopping list in a way that makes Mycroft, um, it, you know, that feeds Mycroft's uh, uh, needs, right? So, you know, if paper if paper towels are less expensive at, you know, uh, through Walmart fulfillment than they are through uh, Target fulfillment, and, you know, even if we have an agreement with Target, you know, I like to see a skill rep best represent the customer and send that order across to Walmart. Um, you know, it, it, that type of shopping experience, I think, doesn't exist because of the back end relationships that the existing platforms have. And I think that there'll be a lot of advantages to it. You know, um, always the lowest price, right? Because the voice assistant represents you. Um, 
we do want to accept, I think, payments and and ideally sit between the customer and the vendor um, someday. Uh, and and today we don't have a partner for that. Um, but it's something that that we'd certainly be interested in looking at. You know, there's there's obviously a lot of work to be done around fraud prevention and, and uh, you know verifying the veracity of orders and so on and so forth. But it, it's something that I'd love to see as part of the Mycroft stack, um, the generic Mycroft stack. And then of course if Retailers out there are looking to deploy a smart speaker, um, you know, into people's kitchens and into people's homes that allows them to order from that retailer. So, for example, if, if Target wanted to ship a Target branded smart speaker that allowed you to shop at Target, um, you know, they can absolutely use our technology to do that. And, you know, one of the places where we see big opportunities is in helping some of these bigger retailers um, to compete head to head with, you know, uh, with Amazon specifically. Um, both in the U.S. market and abroad. So hopefully that answers the question. Okay. I hope so, too. Um, oh, we had a couple more, and I wanted to jump in with the next one. Um, Mark asked, can you speak more on Mycroft's sales and marketing efforts? Sure. So uh, uh, our strategy today is attraction rather than promotion, right? And so, you know, one, one of the one of the things that we did last year as supply chains tightened and COVID made things difficult um, for, for us to ship product uh, was we went from taking a full deposit on a Mark II to taking a dollar deposit. And, and the reason for that was, you know, every time we took a, a full, full payment for a device, it, you know, it created an additional liability for the company. So, you know, we took money from a customer, we owe that customer a product, oh, right? So, so it sits on the, um, it sits on the liability side of the balance sheet. And we had so much demand that we just kept digging this giant hole of, of liability for, for Mark II's that needed to be delivered. So we decided to, to reduce the deposit to a dollar. You know, that way we, we at least know that the, the customer is, is serious about buying the product because they opened their wallet and got out their card and gave us a dollar. Um, but we're not creating a, a giant liability. So, you know, from a sales and marketing perspective, you know, step one is is attraction. So, you know, making sure that that Mycroft is part of the stories that that the broader media is telling about privacy, both in Silicon Valley and in this space in specific. And we've so far avoided mainstream press primarily because our user experience isn't at a level that we're really ready to have a Mark II sit next to a Alexa or a Google Assistant um, and, you know, be evaluated head to head with companies that have spent you know, in some cases, thousands of times more money than we've spent uh, building their technology stack. But as our user experience continues to improve, and and I would expect by, you know, late first quarter, you know, third quarter at the latest next year, that the tech team will be across the line to providing a, a solid experience across the basic skills that we, we plan to support out of the box. Uh, I think that there are, will be a lot more opportunities to um, uh, to be part of that that broader media story, um, you know the the second place I think that we have big opportunities to um, to market our product is across you know this entire ecosystem of uh, the internet that is just abhors the the issues with the privacy have have uh, uh, the lack of privacy have created so. You know, advertising on DuckDuckGo, uh, you know, advertising on news shows and on forums where, uh, you know, folks who are, are like minded uh, are, uh, you know, looking at that crowd that's unplugging from Facebook and giving them uh, other alternatives. Uh, and then finally, you know, one of the things that's happened that's been a real blessing, uh, you know, all going all the way back to the, the Super Bowl ad in 2016, where Alec Baldwin uh, introduced the Amazon. Uh, Amazon Alexa, is that big tech has created a lot of awareness and uh, and demand for smart speakers. Uh, and so, you know, we get to ride that wave a little bit because, you know, people realize that they want to use a smart speaker and that this is something that they, they want to have in their home or in their business or in their hotel chain or whatever, um, because they see what what's happening with, uh, you know, the, the capabilities that it brings to the table. Uh, but then they examine it a little closer and they say, oh, wow, the privacy implications here are significant. You know, I, I'm not really excited about allowing big tech to spy in my kitchen or in my bedroom or in my, you know, my hotel chain. 
and then they pick up the phone and or they pick up an internet search and they say, you know, private alternative to Alexa or Siri or Google Assistant, and they land on our page and they come to our contact form and they send us information. Uh, and we get a ton of those uh, on an almost daily basis uh, from companies that you know, are super small in some cases up to, you know, cruise lines and hotel chains that have tens of thousands of, of rooms. Um, the other thing that, that, you know, we bring to the table is Mycroft's rapidly becoming the standard for privacy in the industry. I, I was on the phone with a, a group called Koala out of uh, Europe that is uh, building voice technology for European industry. Uh, you know, they've got, they've actually raised, I think, three or four times more money than we have and have this huge international team in the European Union that's that's building things on Mycroft to run in manufacturing plants uh, alongside uh, uh, workers, right? So a, a voice assistant that lives in a, in a headset, in their case, that allows workers to collaborate better with robots. Um, that type of activity, you know, whether it's in Europe or whether, you know, we did something similar with NASA, um, you know, whether it's in educational settings, like one of our, our uh, customers, Chatterbox, um, in all of those cases, it, it allows us, you know, being part of the standards, being part of the the uh, the research that's ongoing about privacy, you know, creates big opportunities for us on the sales side of things, because there are a bunch of big companies involved in that. You know, the ones that pop to my mind in Koala, Whirlpool is one of them that's, that's doing a lot of work with them, as well as a bunch of European companies whose names totally escape me right now. So... Uh, Attraction rather than promotion, I think, is where we are today. Uh, and then long term, you know, I see really big opportunities for us to be the white label for other brands that are deploying, uh, that, that want to deploy voice. So, you know, and we've had these conversations with many, many, many brands that, you know, they want to deploy. A, a great example is we had a, a conversation with some of the folks over at Nike early on when we weren't quite ready uh, about the concept of uh, taking various different uh, uh, sports celebrities uh, capturing their voices and including a smart speaker with um, some of the the higher end sneakers that that Nike ships so you know they they ship sneakers that are 350 400 500 dollars um, you know there's enough margin in there to ship a smart speaker with it and if that smart speaker comes with the the voice of a celebrity um, you know that that creates an opportunity for Nike right um, and you know their customers use it for all the same things you normally use use smart speakers for, but maybe they get a, uh, because they're owners, they get early opportunities at some of the, the limited edition speakers that the, the shoe company ships. That type of application really, you know, it isn't possible today with, with our friends in Seattle or our friends in the Valley. Now, they may build something like that as a real possibility, uh, but for many of these brands, you know, they, they already have a really tortured relationship with Silicon Valley Tech, and they're looking to deploy those types of applications with companies that orbit them. Uh, so, you know, the, the way I, I kind of unpack that is, you know, when uh, a company like Whirlpool, for example, uh, does a deal with Google, um, you know, it's inevitably Whirlpool that's in orbit around Google. Google's the center of gravity because it's so much bigger and so much more influential in the global market. Um, when a company like Whirlpool uh, does a project with a company the size of Mycroft, you know, we orbit them and we serve their needs. And so I think that that's another opportunity on the sales and marketing side where, you know, companies that, that are attracted to the technology that do, you know, even the most basic searches for privacy and user agency, you know, land with us. And then, you know, our sales team works to close them as a, as a corporate partner and, and to make sure that they're able to ship our technology in their their own products in you know a white label smart speaker you know in their software you know wherever they choose to use it so that was a very long-winded answer to sales and marketing but i uh, I, I was I just gonna say was, we're getting a lot of questions in here if you don't yeah. mind me dropping I'll, I'll, keep, I'll keep them shorter <laughs> no that's okay the um next question is what is available to use now on my desktop? And before you get to that really quick, I had one that I thought was important to kind of jump to the top. Um, Michael asks, please define smart speaker. So could you do both of those, please? Okay, so a smart speaker, um, it's really interesting you asked that question because the, uh, it, you know, we, we came into the market before smart speaker was a thing. And so when we originally started talking to outside investors, we had to explain it to them. Like, 
you know, it's a speaker, so it plays music and sound, um, but it also listens. So it's got a microphone. In some cases, it's got a screen uh, as well to display information. And when somebody chooses to interact with it, um, you know, either by waking it with the wake word or the context of their conversation, uh, the speaker responds with some type, some type of action. And so, you know, in a broader sense, you can think of a smart speaker as an augmented reality overlay over your uh the room that you're in. So I was, you know, I was kind of joking about renaming the company Meta Meta, but we could, right? Except for Facebook would probably sue us off the off the, the edge of the planet. Um, you know, a smart speaker provides a, a virtual reality overlay over your room, only instead of virtual reality the way that or augmented reality the way that people sometimes view it, like it's gonna be like the Google Glass thing where you know, you look at Bob and it shows his vital statistics next to his head, right? And uh, and gives you access to an information layer. It's actually an audio overlay. It's a it's a, a device that sits in the corner and listens. And when you want to access internet information, you speak to it and it interprets that and comes back with a response. And that response might be something like playing music or accessing news or showing you the time or setting a timer. Um, but of course, those responses also, you know, integrate the Internet with the real world. Right. So you can turn on lights and lock doors and, you know, uh, control uh, vacuum cleaners and, and all kinds of other uh, tasks that, that really require you to access the Internet. And you do that seamlessly. You do that without a screen in many cases. Uh, and you do that with voice using natural language. So uh, so anyway, uh, th that's how I would define a, a smart speaker. In terms of how you use it on your desktop today, it depends on what kind of desktop that you have. On the Linux desktop, uh, you can download and install the, the Mycroft application uh, and unpack it and pair it, and it'll, it'll run on your, your Linux desktop. Uh, on Windows and uh, Mac, I do believe there are Docker containers for Mycroft that work. Uh, I will point out that we've been really careful as a company to stay away from anything that would make it easy for broad scale adoption, right? So the tech, you only have one opportunity to make a first impression. And, you know, the second that we build a Windows installer or an iOS installer or an OS 10 installer, um, you know, it, it opens up, you know, millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of potential customers to us. And, you know, if those customers download the technology stack and it sucks, um, that's really our, our one and only chance to, to make an impression with those customers. So um, to date, we've kept the Mycroft stack uh, more focused on developers, made it um, not deliberately made it difficult, but haven't invested resources to make it easy for uh, for average everyday users to, to use the technology. And, and the reason for that is to preserve our reputation. Uh, when we are ready to deploy on desktop, on mobile, um, on other folks' platforms, uh, we'll create packaging for those platforms that make it super easy to install. Um, but as for, for today, because the user experience continues to be developer pretty, uh, it, you know, we, we've stayed away from making it particularly easy. I was going to drop in. I've got several more questions here. Uh, Scott asks, do you see value in smart voice devices that combine a general purpose voice agent with a custom or application specific Mycroft agent, potentially along the lines of, and there's Roman numeral seven, industries voice interoperability initiative. I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, there's there's a lot of initiatives going on to help make voice assistants work together, um, you know, and we're part of those. And I think at least one of them has adopted our st our stack as the standard um, through which they're going to be they're going to be standardizing um, some of the interfaces. Uh, I think that there is a lot of a lot of uh, value to making the smart speaker or making the end terminal uh, uh, dumb or uh, agent agnostic at least. Um, because it, it creates the opportunity to create a ubiquitous overlay, right? So if if I have a friend who's just really into Google Assistant for whatever reason, he's got one of those things in every single room. He's even got one on his front porch. So you can actually walk up to his house and like say, hey, play scary music on all the speakers at like three in the morning and it'll play it'll play them on every speaker at his house. Uh, but yeah, uh, you know, when I walk into his home, you know, I should be able to say, you know, hey, Mycroft, you know, play my favorite fairy playlist. 
and and have that work uh, for me, you know, you know, using voice identification and, and you know, other other uh, other tools to determine that I am who I am. Uh, we're not quite there yet. And I, and I think that there's some really deep privacy concerns that need to be addressed before something like that is built. Uh, but certainly, I think interoperability is important. Um, you know, I think that standards are important, uh, provided, and this is a big pro provision, uh, provided that they're not set by one tech, tech company to their own benefit, right? Like everybody wants to set the standard to whatever they're doing and force everybody else to come along. Um, you know, I think that the tech companies are really good at that. And so I think that we should look very carefully on any standards that are adopted to make sure, number one, the company that's proposing them doesn't have a bunch of patents that make it impossible for other people to, to use the standard, um, or that if they do have patents, that by using the standard software, they implicitly license them. Uh, and then number two, that the, the standards are built in a way that makes them supportable by the broader community. Uh, I really do concern myself when it comes to standards in big tech, that tech will set standards that force everybody onto an upgrade and update treadmill uh, where developers have to constantly push updates all the time in order to keep up with the standard. Um, you know, that, that, that really puts co potential competitors on a back foot and gives the, the folks that are setting the standard a significant advantage. Um, so I think we want to pay, pay close attention as those standards develop to make sure that tech doesn't play its, its game. So anyway, Chris, you, you had an, hopefully that answers the question. Chris, you had anything, you had another one? Yeah, I've got a few more. Hold on, let me get to it. Uh, Louise asked any news on the Mark II? You alluded a little bit about that, but can you get us a really quick Mark II update? Sure, so we've been shipping dev kits for a little while now. Um, the Mycroft team was actually here um, going through, it, the non-technical team members were going through the exercise of, of building Mark IIs from scratch um, so that we could pay closer attention to how that, that construction process will work. Um, you know, the design is done. Uh, we selected a contract manufacturer uh, last month. We announced it, it's, it's Aztec out of Malaysia. Um, we're really excited to be working with them. Uh, we're now trying to uh, secure adequate parts and get our supply chain stood up to the point where we can start mass production and then importantly, keep mass production going. Um, Right now, we're having the same supply chain issues that the rest of the world is having. So, you know, things, ridiculous things like little 70 cents, 70 cent amplifier chips uh, are unavailable and are making it difficult for us to stand up the line. Uh, but I think that the supply chain uh, disruptions will settle out in the next six months. And so we're aiming for the third quarter of next year for shipping. Uh, but that is dependent both on supply chain and then on funding. So we're, we're out raising money as well. All right. Uh, next question. Josh asks, are there any plans to include a specific piece of hardware to allow Mimic 2 to function on IoT low power devices locally? Josh, sounds like a developer. Yeah. So Mimic 2 is a speech synthesis engine um, that we trained using the voice of Kusal, the intern. Uh, who is now, I, I, I kid you not, an army ranger, good for Kusal. Uh, the uh, Mimic 2 engine uses a machine learning approach to, to rendering speech. Uh, I know that they have been working on getting it working on lower power devices. They've also been working on prosody, pro, prosody cadence, and tone. Um, a lot of that work has actually been going on within the Mozilla community as well as uh, on the speech recognition side uh, in the Koki community. And, and as you we look at those technologies as they develop, it, they, they appear to be getting more resource intensive, not less resource intensive over time. Um, and so, you know, making a better prosody engine that uses machine learning run on a smaller chipset uh, is certainly on the roadmap. Um, we're not there yet. Uh, someday soon, I hope. Uh, and then, you know, if you do, if you are within our community, I'd encourage you to ping uh, Ken, uh, uh, Ken, Ken, Ken Smith, uh, who's one of our developers uh, down in Sarasota, Florida. Uh, Ken's been doing a lot of work on making Minecraft work on, on low resource uh, stacks, just kind of in his spare time. Uh, you may ping Ken in the forums and ask him, hey, you know, where is this? And, and if you have the ability to help, you know, how can I help? Because uh, I, I know that we'd love to see it. And uh, I know that Ken's doing some work in that direction. 
Okay, the next one is from uh, Simon. He asks, since you are focused on values like privacy rather than maximizing profit, have you ever considered becoming a purpose corporation? Uh, yeah, B Corporation. Yes, is the answer. Um, uh, yes. It, you don't want to elaborate as to why. Okay, yeah, please. Well, no, I, I can I can say two things. Yes, we've considered it. Um, yes, uh, uh, I, I think we even have drafts of the language ready to, to in, incorporate into our into our uh, corporate charter. Uh, if we haven't already, I, I would expect that to happen uh, at some point in the future. Uh, and I'm actually scratching my head wondering if maybe that actually got done because I know we had lengthy discussions about it. Uh, the, you know, we've always, regardless of what the actual corporate organization, we've always been purpose driven. And, and I don't think that that's actually independent of profit, right? So, you know, if we abandon the principle of privacy and we abandon the principle of user agency, then we're just a really, really, really underfunded competitor to Alexa and Siri and Google Assistant, right? Um, I think the, the place where we have an advantage is that um, all of the Silicon Valley tech companies have damaged their brands so thoroughly around privacy that they can't credibly address the issue. And so, you know, even if our friends at Google had just the, the, the most sincere intention of providing a really truly private experience for the Google Assistant, and maybe they do, nobody would believe them, right? Like a vast majority of the public just wouldn't believe it because of their past behavior. Um, you know, in our case, I think that that creates a really great opportunity. So our focus on privacy really is, I mean, it's definitely a moral stance, but it's also a market stance. You know, as, as we look at the market, the research that we've seen says right around 20% of the smart speaker market or the potential start smart speaker market is sitting on the sidelines, you know, because of the privacy issue, right? And that's a huge, huge market. I mean, you're talking about billions and billions of dollars in sales that are sitting idle because, you know, people simply don't trust the big tech companies. So as our manufacturing comes online, you know, I think that that's our, our addressable market. And that, that means a total addressable market size of something like $3 billion uh, and growing every year. Uh, and so I, I think that the, the privacy aspect is actually our competitive advantage. And it is something that we should continue to 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 uh, talk about and of course to implement because you know it, it's great great to talk about privacy but you have to actually provide it and so that's it's one of the things that we do and and we'll continue to do all right roger asks is it possible to partner with open phone os's like lineage or sailfish seems like that would be a community that would appreciate voice that is private yes and we'd like to do more of that we're limited in resources is why we have it. Um, but yes, the, the, all of the open phone OSs um, are, are real potential um, distribution mechanisms for us. Uh, and I think that they're going forward, there are big opportunities in being on mobile devices that aren't running uh, vanilla Android or, or OS, iOS. Uh, Scott asks, do you see value in adding edge on device voice technology to your software stack? For example, user authentication using voice or commands that would that work even if you lose internet connectivity? Uh, yeah, and uh, actually at, at some point we'd like to move the entire experience to the to the edge. I mean, the, the cloud experience that we provide now kind of comes back to that question about Mimic 2 earlier, which is, you know, it just takes so much resources to, to process a full language speech, right? Um, that it's just really unaffordable to put that on, on a device. And, and, you know, and in addition to being kind of a technical challenge from a cooling perspective and so on and so forth. Uh, so yeah, the, the, as Silicon continues to get cheaper and more powerful, um, you know, and a, as we learn more about how to pack these models down uh, and make them run and with fewer resources, uh, moving the entire experience to the edge, I think is the most private experience possible. And, and so, yeah, I'd, I'd love to be able to do it honestly today uh, and provide people with the smart speaker that sits there and the only time it goes out to the interweb uh, is when it needs to obtain data to answer a query. Um, other than that, everything is local. Uh, you know, I think that that's the best, the best way to provide privacy 
uh, for individual users in their homes. But then, of course, you know, that's also a great solution for using voice assistance in boats, right, or in cars or in aircraft or in spacecraft or, um, you know, in remote locations or on job sites, you know, places that might not have uh, ubiquitous Internet connectivity. You know, having a voice assistant that runs on device it would be a really, really powerful tool. So that, that's definitely in the future. Um, it's just a matter of, of both waiting for Moore's Law to help us solve the problem as well as, once again, resources. I had a feeling you were going to bring out Moore's Law on that one. Uh, next question is, will you establish certification requirements for your smart speaker using Mycroft to assure the quality of the user experience? For example, false rejection ratio, maximum false rejection ratio, false alarm ratio, and response accuracy? Uh, yeah. The, I mean, as uh, hopefully, we're crossing our fingers that one of the manufacturers out there will eventually come around and, and bang on our door and say, hey, we want to make a, a smart speaker that includes the Mycroft stack. Um, you know, when that happens, if it carries our brand, there's going to, it's going to require, um, certain performance metrics uh, and so in, in that case you know we'll we'll require a certification you know we are an open stack though and so if people want to take our technology and use it um, wherever they want to use it and they don't use our brand you know they're free to do with that as they choose uh, but if it has you know Mycroft's logo on it uh, the goal is to provide a, a a consistent experience you know regardless of the touch point whether it's a mobile device or a smart speaker or a desktop or a car or a boat or whatever all right next question is what is your business model with oems wanting to integrate mycroft nre royalty support yes <laughs> you want to elaborate a little bit all of those right like um you know the what we've found is we've worked with um work with other companies that are looking at Mycroft is they do need support in order to make it work and work well within their, within their technology. So, so that's a place where, um, where we can be helpful. Uh, you know, there's generally going to be a non-recurring, uh, charge to help get them stood up and help get the, uh, you know, all the, the specs built and help them to, to figure out how to integrate this into their product. Uh, and then on an ongoing basis, you know, a licensing fee for, you know, backend software and other things that are licensed in a way that, that requires a payment. So we are an open source company, but our licenses are designed for um, designed in a way that if you're going to make commercial use of the product, uh, you, you need to have a conversation with us. Well, that is all the questions I have in the chat. Uh, if an, any other um, attendees want to add a question or even um, ask yourself now would be a great time and Joshua is there anything from we, it sounds like we've got a lot of really great uh, developer uh, focused questions today is there anything else you wanted to add no I'm 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 really upbeat on the future of what we're doing you know the the we've got there's two types of hardware companies. I wouldn't call us a hardware company, but we have to make an initial version of the tech in order to, to have a reference device for people to to play with and evaluate and, you know, in some cases, white label and use. Uh, you know, there's two types. There's the type that have a warehouse that's full of things that people don't want and the type that has an empty warehouse because they've sold all the product. Um, you know, from day one, we've been the second type, right? It, you know, everything that we've produced has gone out the door just as fast as we could produce it. So I'm really excited about taking that and instead of producing, you know, hundreds or thousands of units a, a month, you know, eventually producing, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of units a month, uh, either, you know, with us as a software component of somebody else's speaker or, you know, us producing reference devices natively. So, you know, I view it as a, a big opportunity. Um, you know, I view it as a, a largely untapped market, you know, the, the privacy market for smart speakers, I, I, you know, I challenge you to point at something that, that, you know, rivals us in terms of its ability to, to provide privacy and also, you know, provide a, a, a meaningful, a good user experience. Uh, you know, and I'm really happy with, you know, the team that we've built, we've got, you know, great folks on the, on the technical side, we've got 60,000 plus uh, developers inside the community that are doing work in various ways on the stack. Um, we've got great leadership uh, from Michael and 
you know, we've got great support from folks like Chris and Sarah and others that, that work really hard to, to uh, make all the gears in the machine move. Um, so I'm extremely optimistic about our future, uh, you know, big market, great product, you know, big barrier for other folks to, to enter and at least into our segment of the market. And, uh, and, you know, first mover advantage, you know, all of those are moving in our direction. All right. I have a couple more questions that have come in. Michael asked, uh, so please, please supply an overview of how Mycroft works on my desktop and the implications to privacy. Sure. So Mycroft on the desktop, um, you know, it runs an agent that, that opens up the microphone. Uh, the wake words are processed locally, so we don't actually have visibility of them in the cloud. Uh, when it detects the wake word, it takes a short sound sample and sends it up for transcription. Uh, that transcription is aggregated across all the devices. So the the, the machine learning uh, system that is actually doing the speech recognition doesn't have visibility of where those queries are coming from. Uh, we feed back a, uh, uh, a text transcription of what was said, and then the natural language understanding actually takes place on the device. Uh, once the device has figured out what you're trying to do, it either takes an action, like you know, open a web browser window or you know, turn on a light or, you know, whatever you have a program to do. Uh, or if it's response is speech, it'll send the speech, um, the text up to a, a speech synthesis engine. Uh, we synthesize the response, send it back as audio and it plays it out the speaker. So all of that takes place very, very quickly. Um, you know, the, there, there are privacy implications there in that, you know, it is calling back and forth to internet. Um, we have done the best that we can to make sure that those are, are, those interactions are encrypted. Uh, we log nothing beyond the, we log nothing and keep nothing beyond the length of time we need to service the query. So there's no history associated with that. Uh, and, you know, with us in terms of privacy, we are an opt in organization if you want to share data. So, you know, we do ask our, the folks using Mycroft if they're willing to share data so that we can improve the machine learning models and improve the user experience for everybody. Uh, but yeah, there's no requirement to, and, and by default, we don't take any of that data. So it, it's only people who affirmatively say, hey, I want to share data that we, we keep that data. And then finally, there's transparency. You know, you can look at every line of code in our software and examine exactly what we're doing with the data and how we're handling it. And, uh, you know, if you do spot a security vulnerability or a privacy problem, it'll exist uh, only as long as I'm uh, unaware of it. And, uh, you know, openness and transparency are, are really critical to privacy because, you know, as we've seen with, with the Silicon Valley giants, many of whom are under indictment in the European Union by all of the European Union nations, by the federal government here in the United States, as well as all 50 states. Um, and it, it takes quite a lot of work to be indicted by basically the entire government across all of its layers. Um, you know, these black box software packages that they build oftentimes don't do what they say they do and they don't treat private data the way they say they do. Um, and so openness and transparency and the ability to look inside it is really critical from a privacy perspective. Um, Roger asks, any plans to put Mycroft into automobiles? Yes, just as soon as we have an automaker that wants to do it. Uh, we did take an investment from Jaguar Land Rover and we did do an integration with the F-Type sports car. Uh, but that was very, very early in our development. And uh, importantly, that was with their U.S. Uh, team. Uh, and, you know, if you've worked with Jaguar in the past, you realize that the, the center of gravity within that company is in the U.K. And so despite building really good relationships here in the U.S., to actually get built into the car requires having great relationships in the United Kingdom. And for whatever reason, personnel or communications, that, that never happened. But uh, it does... You know, it does highlight a great uh, application for the technology within automobiles. Um, Jaguar did make an investment. And, you know, as our user experience continues to improve, we plan to circle back there as well as with uh, the providers of, of uh, technology to the automaker. So folks like Bosch, who, um, you know, build a lot of the parts that go into cars. Uh, the other place that we have a lot of interest, and if anybody has a, a connection over there, we'd love to we'd love to talk to them. Um, you know, it, it came to my attention last week that our friends at Tesla have a music streaming service, um, which I guess they've licensed from a third party. But 
is included with their vehicles. And I think it would be a lot of fun to build a Tesla branded smart speaker um, that goes, you know, maybe they give it away free with the test drive uh, or, you know, shows up with your with your car and allows you to interact with the vehicle from your kitchen, you know, provides all of the other smart speaker aspects and then uses Tesla's music streaming for, for music. Um, you know, I know that they have some voice technology inside of that vehicle today, but I, I suspect that um, given the amount of compute on that vehicle, on those vehicles and the full-time network connection, that there are some real opportunities for uh, building voice assistant tech into them. And, uh, you know, the other guy who's launching spaceships uh, has a voice assistant. You know, I think that there's there's a lot of value in, in bringing one into the Tesla ecosystem. So if anybody has a good connection at Tesla, I'd love to have a chat. All right. I think we might have more questions than we can answer in the last 10 minutes. But we'll do a let's... speed round. We got eight minutes. Speed round. So Michael asked, so no log can be obtained? Uh, we don't log anything beyond the length of time that we need it to provide the query. So the query comes through the computer. We transcribe it or take action on your behalf. If you have not opted in to share your data, it is deleted. And that's that. Okay. Nick asked, is server part of Mycroft open source and available to the public? It is. It's called Selene. Um, the Selene architecture is all available. It's fairly well documented. Um, it does take several VMs working together to do that, to provide that service. Uh, but it is all open source. It is all available in our GitHub repo. All right. Roger asks, could Mycroft be an encrypted phone slash messenger system? If so, how would it compare to other privacy phones? Yes, you could probably integrate Signal into Mycroft without too much trouble. And as with many, many other things with Mycroft, you may get into the community and, and look and say, you know, is there a Signal integration for Mycroft and find that somebody has already built it and I'm just not aware of it. Uh, that happens all the time. Uh, somebody comes up with an idea and it's like, oh yeah, like some community member built that a year ago. So I'd, I'd have a good, I'd, I'd go and have a, a look at it. I don't think that we'll ever be a phone operating system, but I think that we can be a nice layer on top of a, a privacy phone um, that gives people the ability to use modern voice tech uh, in a private way. Uh, and I think that Signal would be a real good back end for that, both for the voice and the messaging. Josh asks, what are the plans for Mycroft on Android, either full stack or UI recording on device and processing remotely? Uh, probably the second and actually not probably. There are people who have it working uh, in the second way, including that Koala team in Europe that are using a 10 and a half inch um, Samsung tablet that interestingly on their slide was 10 and a half inches, but 400 grams, which totally confused me because I thought they were European in centimeters. Um, yeah, there, there's been a lot of work doing, doing, uh, getting Minecraft working on Android. And as far as I know, there, there are several implementations out there. Uh, eventually, I'd like to obviously move the whole stack onto the, onto the phone. And I think that Moore's Law is going to get us from here to there sooner rather than later, especially as some of these tensor processing units and other things become available. Um, so yeah, I mean, a Android is, is an obvious place where we'd like to be. Uh, once again, we do want to be careful not to deploy an Android app to the Google Play Store that doesn't work well um, because it it has the potential to do more harm than good. Um, but once we cross the line to a user experience that we feel comfortable, you know, making available to the general public, uh, you know, an Android app is definitely in our future. Uh, Michael asks, how do you protect from manufacturer slash China backdoors in chip design? Uh, I don't think we're using any Chinese chips. I think we're using Taiwanese and U.S. chips primarily. Um, but yeah, you, you know, supply chain attacks. Uh, uh, supply chain attacks are something that's difficult to defend against. Um, you know, using reputable suppliers with the reputable manufacturers is really the best we could do at our size. As we get bigger, I, I think that's something that we need to pay attention to because I agree there are there are definitely potential downsides to using chips that were made in mainland China. And Simon asks, despite the improvements, Mimic still sounds quite robotic. Can you talk about its future development and how to make it sound more natural? Sure. So the original Mimic uses the Alan Pope voice, which is a concatenative approach and is very robotic. Uh, 
Mimic 2 uh, uses a machine learning model that was trained by Crisal, the intern who I mentioned earlier, uh, and sounds a lot better. Uh, but even Mimic 2 was built several years ago now, and the state of the art for speech synthesis using machine learning has improved drastically in the last three years. Uh, and so, you know, I think it really comes down to taking the Kusal data, um, you know, feeding it to newer algorithms, uh, and then if necessary, obtaining additional data for that for that speaker. Uh, I think that the, the other piece that I, I'm looking forward to seeing is using transfer learning to train these models. So using a model that sounds good from a prosody cadence and tone perspective, but then uh, layering a voice on top of it using transfer learning. I think both of those are approaches that can sig significantly improve the, the quality of the voice. Um, and for, in terms of the, the quality of the voice and the machine learning feedback loops and some of the other stuff that we're trying to do, it's primarily resource, resource constraints that keep us from doing the work. We, we just have only have so many developers. And even with the big open source community, um, you know, it's very difficult to solve some of these problems. Um, you know, open source developers are awesome and they work hard, but a lot of times they deliver a 90, 95% solution and the remaining 5% is on the full-time staff. And, you know, we have very limited full-time staff. That is all of the questions I have. And so I just wanted to see if I couldn't get you to share a little bit more about where the community can learn about Mycroft and learn about our Reg CF. Sure. So, you know, we're out raising money. Uh, one of the things that we believe in as a company is that everybody who contributes to the company, one way, you know, whether they're a developer or somebody who buys one of our speakers or they just mention us to a friend um, should have an opportunity to invest um, that we shouldn't be beholden to one or two Silicon Valley venture capital firms. We would rather have a broad community of small investors. So uh, we've been raising money through crowdfunding since day one when we did our first Kickstarter. Uh, today, we're raising an equity crowdfunding round of about five million dollars, uh, just a shade under that uh, through Start Engine. Um, Chris can drop the link to the Start Engine campaign in the uh, in the chat here, uh, you know, the, the we appreciate anybody who's interested in in kind of taking this roller coaster ride with us into the future. Uh, we see uh, big success over the coming years, and uh, you know, we see big opportunities in the space uh, for folks like us who are focused on privacy and user agency and some of the other things that Silicon Valley has has failed to materialize. Thank you, Joshua. And um, I think with that, we will go ahead and end it. We had a, uh, a nice hour long conversation. We will host another one of these. We're going to have one with our designer, Derek, and he's gonna talk about why the design of the Mark, Mark II is the way it is. And one with Michael Lewis, our CEO, and he's gonna talk about roadmap. So uh, stay tuned. Thank you so much. Thanks folks, have a great day.